It leads then, number five, to the resistance of evil. That when Satan wants to put up a fight, he finds the right characters to pull it off. Uh, he looks for madmen, for extremists, because Satan doesn't know the day of the rapture. Say, so how do you know that? Jesus said, nobody knows the day or the hour, not even the what? Angels. What is Satan? A fallen angel. Satan is not God. He's powerful and brilliant, but he's not omniscient. He does not know the date of the rapture. He can read the Bible. He can read the newspaper. He can say, wow, things are heating up in the Middle East. This looks like the big one. I better get a guy ready, etc. But his hands are bound by the sovereignty of God. He cannot make a move until the restrainer is removed and the church is called home to heaven. So he sits around in a restless search looking for a Hitler, looking for a Stalin, looking for a, a Muhammad Ahmadinejad, somebody who is wild enough, mad enough, insane enough to think that if I kill enough people, I have really made my place in history. Yeah, he's one of the all-time bad guys. Uh, and uh, we know what prophecy tells us is coming ultimately in the Middle East, uh, 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 an alliance between Russia and Iran. With the fall of communism, people said, well, that's over with. They won't get back together. They share a common border that's over a thousand miles long. Uh, recently, Putin met with Ahmadinejad uh, and said, don't worry, uh, we'll take care of you. We'll stand behind you. Uh, we'll trade. We'll sell you stuff, like bombs, uh, and uh, what all. Uh, and uh, well, we don't want to see your country collapse because it's too close to our own. And again, I don't know the timing of God. But I know what the Bible says in Ezekiel 38 and 39, that eventually in the battle of Gog and Magog, uh, which may come before the rapture or could come right after the rapture, you're going to have Israel invaded by virtually everybody around her from Magog in southern Russia to Persia, the ancient name of Iran, the Arab nations, Kush, Sudan, Black Africa, Libya, Turkey, all of these countries are named in that prophecy, all of them pointing to Jerusalem, all of them coming in the last days to conquer the nation of Israel. And the Bible tells us that Christ himself will intervene and fire will fall on Magog and Magog will be destroyed. Do not be surprised in your lifetime if there is a nuclear strike in the Middle East that involves Iran. I, I'm not advocating that. I, I'm not wishing for that. Just because we believe that that battle will come one day and that ultimately the battle of Armageddon will come as well does not mean we want to hasten the day. It doesn't mean that we're irresponsible in how we deal with life. It simply means we know what the predictions are and we want to be wise and discerning. As Jack shared with us earlier, Prophecy is not written to scare us. It's written to prepare us. It's not written to frighten us. It's written to invite us. Come to Christ while there's hope and while there's time. And then sixthly, eventually you'll see the rise of a powerful world leader. He will not be identified till after the rapture, but he could easily be on the scene already. If the rapture were to occur anytime soon, the Antichrist would already have to be alive. Now, people have wasted a lot of time trying to figure out who he is. People say, oh, it's Nero. Uh, if you change the spelling on the end of his name, it sounds like 666. No, it's the Pope. No, it's Charlemagne. It's Napoleon. Uh, it's Hitler. It's Mussolini. It's Stalin. Uh, it's Bernie, uh, the purple dragon guy. Uh, and... Uh, and I've heard people say, it's the World Wide Web because WWW uh, is uh, the number six uh, in Hebrew. Yeah, except it's not a W in Hebrew, it's a V. Uh, but anyhow, be that as it may, uh, it's pronounced that like a W. Uh, come on, the number of the Antichrist has to add up to 666, not just three sixes. It's not Ronald Wilson Reagan, six letters in each of his three names. I had people try to tell me that years ago. It's not Juan Carlos. He's faded. Uh, it's not uh, Prince Charles. Uh, he can't run his own life, let alone the world. So I think it's Al Gore. Give me a break. Nobody from Tennessee is going to conquer the world. Uh, it's not going to happen. But one day... Somebody will. And I think the Bible makes it very clear that he'll come from the Western world. Now, whether he is a 
apostate Christian, a secularist, a Muslim or an apostate Muslim. The Bible says he doesn't regard any God. So he is not a believer uh, in any God, in anything but himself. But that powerful world ruler will gain control of the global economy, of the world government, and ultimately of a world religion in which he will demand that he be worshipped as God. Thankfully, the Scripture tells us clearly in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that that man of sin cannot be revealed until the restrainer is removed, until after the rapture of the Spirit-baptized, Spirit-filled church is taken home to heaven. You say, how do you know that we are the restrainer? Because Jesus said that we're to be what? The salt and light to the world, that we're to be the voice of morality to a fallen world, and it's the power of the Spirit that holds back evil and lawlessness in this world, Satan cannot indwell somebody to be the Antichrist until after the rapture. So I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. I'm not even looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. But finally, the seventh sign that will end all the debates, the rapture of the church. Because when the rapture occurs, the rapture changes everything. Millions of people suddenly, instantly are gone. The dead in Christ are raised incorruptible. We that are alive and remain are caught up. The biblical term for the rapture, harpazo. You say, how do you translate that in English? Zap, you're out of here. Uh, that's what it, it literally means, snatched away, caught away. It, it's like you, you see it in one moment and poosh, it's gone the next. It's out of here uh, to the glory of God. Uh, you say, now wait a minute. We're just going to be raptured right up through the ceiling. Well, if you can resurrect a dead body out of a casket, if you can raise it out of the dust and the ashes and put it back together, God can rapture you up through the ceiling and put you back together uh, on the other side. Jesus, when he rose from the dead at a glorified body, he could appear instantly inside of a room and then disappear. But it was a real body. He said, touch me and see that I am real. Put your finger in the nail prints and see that it's really me. The nail prints of Christ were still there in a risen, glorified body. They'll be there for all eternity, shouting to us every time we see the nail-scarred Savior. I love you. I love you. I love you. I did it all for you. Hallelujah. When the rapture comes, we're going home to the Father's house, home to heaven, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Time is running out. Make sure that you use it wisely. And make sure that you're sure that you're sure that you're ready to go if He were to come. It's one thing to come to a conference like this and get all excited about what's happening in the world, all excited about what's going to happen in the future. But the most important decision that you could make at this conference is to decide that it's time for me to give my life to Christ. It's time for me to put my faith and trust in what He did on the cross. Say, well, I'm a pretty good person. You're not as good as Jesus. Uh, I've done the best I could. The best you could did not die for the sins of the world. When you look at the Savior dying on the cross, if that is not enough to satisfy the demand of the Father, nothing is. Nothing that you and I can do will ever be good enough. Jesus alone is good enough. And the sinless Son of God was made sin for us that we might know the righteousness of Christ. And He offers it to us as a free gift. And all we have to do is take it by faith. Father, speak to our hearts this afternoon. Challenge us where we need to be challenged. Convict us where we need to be convicted. And Father, I pray that You would help us to be sure that we're sure that if Jesus were to come today, we're ready to go. Father, as Pastor Jack comes to apply that application of that invitation to us, some of us need today to say yes to Christ. Help us to say it sincerely, genuinely, from the depth of our heart.